I do believe that COVID-19 unraveled or unveiled, I can say, the injustice and inequality of black people. Dealing with this pandemic now, the actual fact that uh, um, the real pandemic is racism, which has been here a long, long time. It took a lot of death of black Obama death because the number of highest and, and people who have passed across nationally have been the BME. So now the mainstream providers are jumping on the bandwagon, which we welcome. We're not being dismissive and we're not just being critical for the sake of being critical. But the question becomes, that partnership should have existed before the pandemic. We've become fed up of being used as a tick boxes. Ready? Yes. It's been severe to be honest. We're already working with um, members of the Yemeni community and the Bayman community that are in areas of um, uh, severe disadvantage, um, uh, poverty, mental health uh, issues. So, uh, so, so we're working with individuals that are already struggling. Um, and then you have COVID-19, which impact ha had a negative knock-on effect. Um, people that were on minimum wage lost their jobs um, uh, or furloughed. Um, uh, parents with vulnerable children had lost their care support. And the infrastructure of the care system was just, just sort of seized in a way. Uh, um, so. Um, yeah, um, it, it, it's had a, a severe knock-on effect. Obviously one of the big issues for us is that, you know, we're, we're experiencing a lot of death, you know. COVID-19, for some reason, is um, killing us at three to four times the rate of, of other communities in the city, regionally and nationally. I'm not saying that we we're the only ones that have been impacted, no, but I'm saying that in black communities you have, you know, people living in shared accommodation, um, families uh, living in two bedroom, three bedroom accommodations that, are, you know, that are too large to, to uh, to, to, to manage that type of accommodation, uh, accommodating them all. Health, poverty, unemployment, all of that coming together makes it worse. I think they've been impacted more. I think it's to do with racism. Uh, I think uh, it's also to do with the kind of jobs that uh, many black people are in. They're usually key. Uh, jobs, key roles, key workers, uh, either in taxis or su supermarkets or hospitals. Uh, uh, they, they're, they're working in, 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 in the jobs uh, that unfortunately that they're in. And these, these are the kind of jobs where you're most likely to catch COVID. Unfortunately, uh, uh, for, you know, whether they're government representatives or local authority representatives, um, COVID-19 has only highlighted what we've been talking about for decades in this city, to my knowledge, at least six decades. You know, we've been saying that the, uh, um, the deprivation and poverty that, that some of us uh, experience, um, our proximity to, uh, the, uh, um, to the virus, in, you know, I mean, care workers and home workers, Etc. You know, early on when you know PPE equipment was not always forthcoming, it wasn't of sufficient quality. It is a complex issue that we need to look into in more detail. It is not just about a reaction issue in terms of we dying more or this is happening to us. No, it is more complex. And for me, everything comes to finance. That's my own view. I think also housing of multiple occupation plays a role in that. So, uh, and also where those communities live, the poverty areas that they live in, I think is, is fundamental. If you live in deprived areas, you're more likely to, uh, to catch COVID because of the economic situation that you're living in. Well, it's the local authority have not played their part in supporting 
the, the BME. The BME in Sheffield makes 20%, 19 to 20% according to the census of the population of the uh, wider. So if we make 20% of the population and we ha uh, and yet no resources have come our way, it is shameful to the, uh, and, and, and to the mainstream and the structural providers because we are supporting them. For those of us who are in a key role position, the leaders position. We've been talking about these issues for, for a long time. COVID-19 has uh, put the spotlight on that and then, you know, uh, uh, post Black Lives Matters, etc. has put another spotlight on it. You know, people feel like they have to do something now uh, about uh, uh, the issue that they presented us with for, for far too long. They've been impacted, uh, like most of the local citizens. They're not exception. Whatever the challenges are there is, they have similar challenges. But the only more challenge so they have for those who are unable to speak the language, it's difficult to make that phone call from home. So they are reliant on someone else to help them. So that's where we fit in. From my own perspective, the challenge has been uh, communicational. I mean, the communication is not simplified to enable people on the ground to actually understand what the leadership wants from them. Uh, the messaging that people have been getting has been confusing to a lot of people. Uh, people don't understand the rules that the government has laid down. We had a survey asking the women, how do you feel like this information? Do you understand? How, what do you understand? And uh, how can you really help your family to actually prevent and pre protect themselves from catching the virus, the COVID-19 virus. And uh, from that survey, we found that there is a lot of distortion of information there. And then we said, okay, maybe if we meet together, we can have a core understanding. And when we all understand what we are supposed to do, then it is easier for us to help others I think one of the, the devastating ones was having um, uh, people within our community that had suffered severely with COVID-19 and passed away. The ripple of that devastation went right through, you know, uh, uh, within our communities. And I think the hard part was the way that the, the burial, the illness, that type of support that you could offer uh, your neighbours, your you know uh, people that you know, uh, and, and 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 the way of grieving was was was, um, was very difficult. It, it it changed, and I think we found that really hard. Um, so yeah. There's been huge increase in the mental health services, and it became more difficult even for the organisations such as ours to access the mainstream services because the mainstream, the top priority became the COVID nineteen. So when you call an ambulance, uh, <clears throat> it takes time for them to come. And if it, even if they come, because it's mental health issues, they're not well equipped. The ambulance services only react to emergency services. And I've been dealing with cases where there has been uh, 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 cases where uh, suicidal cases, mental health issues, and it's very limited what the mainstream services can do. And, it, and that has become a huge impact in the community. Sorry, I'm really emotional about this because we had, you know, individuals that had passed away and um, really hard. And uh, I think there being a community coming together as one unit, um, uh, leading, pushing the drive, and in, in a way, we wanted to um, send also the message that we were not going to tolerate. Um, uh, lack of resources to BEMA communities that were already suffering uh, and I think that message has come through. What we did, we created a consortium of communities in Sheffield. The Sheffield BEMA COVID-19 Action Group is a group of uh, around 14 community organisations coming together to actually provide for the most needed in our community and our work has been brilliant on the ground. It's sharing resources, sharing information, it's supporting each other, um, uh, you know, and sometimes it's um, signposting, referrals, um, so I think it's really important. Um, we, we've sort of, with COVID-19, 
we've sort of got a lot stronger in terms of partnership work because we felt that um, that has been a key um, success. Um, uh, particularly the uh, BIMA Working Action Group and thanks to Abdul Shaiu for helping lead that and take that forward. Um, uh, we've worked really well together. This BIMA group has been going on now since the 12th of March and it's still going very strong. So we unify our uh, system of delivering food so we're not uh, du duplicating each other. But we also target people, target particular communities, the inner city areas uh, to try and give them help. Uh, and this uh, Bema community has been a way of, for the first time in decades, where people have got together to try and help each other and support each other and look after each other. And I think it's gone extremely well. We are a very close community knit. We have WhatsApp group. We meet uh, and, and we get information if someone is lonely in a property, needs food, we will deliver food. If they need any following up their uh, universal credit, of funding or benefits, we will do that and support them. And if they have language barrier, we, will, we are able to advocate on their behalf. So it's advocacy, information, support, social gathering for those people who are isolated when they wake up in the morning, who are retired, who don't know where to go. They will come here, have a cup of tea, have dinner and have interaction. And if they need any support in terms of language, fulfilling, we provide all that kind of support. Sadaka has a long history of serving, you see, uh, mainly the African diaspora and uh, also any other community. And uh, every single week, without, before the pandemic, we were receiving around 300 people a week. This was uh, the sort of number that we will have. We provide uh, a food pharmacy to the vulnerable people in the community uh, during the pandemic. I uh, volunteer here. At Hadfield Institute. Um, I volunteer with the Parent Support Network, supporting family with vulnerable children, children of disabilities, um, and vulnerable adults. Um, I also uh, volunteer with the food parcels, and um, that's also providing food parcels to family with vulnerable children, uh, vulnerable adults, and families with disabilities. We all have designated areas and we also have designated groups. So each uh, volunteer will do between 15 and 20 families. As we're delivering the food parcel, we check that they're all right. Uh, we make sure that you know they have basic needs. Um, and then they may request uh, a referral somewhere, uh, signposting. Um, some of them like to share, some of them are fine, they're all right, they've, they've got everything that they need. Um, but really we're just listening, absorbing information and then coming back and seeing what we can apply and how we can support them. But we also provide advocacy work, advice work, a uh, contact point for the elderly and people who are in isolation uh, at this particular moment. Uh, we also have adult learning classes and we run a gym uh, and a social cafe do sort of share information, advise uh, people how it needs to be, you know, and uh, this is going to be something long term, so we try and uh, use different ways of, you know, uh, um, working, you know, um, and, and, and sharing and communicating. But now, since the pandemic has happened, most of the mainstream, the statutory, the public health, the local authority, the volunteers and, and action, Sheffield, are all wanting to support us, which we welcome. Uh, it's a bit too late, but we welcome it. And we are now talking to them in a constructive way so that at least we have a representation and voice within the city. We consider ourselves citizens of Sheffield, and yet we're completely marginalized in the 20%. You cannot be a leader in a city and then say, I'm only gonna look at these people and forget about this, because the people that you've forgotten, they will then come and bite you. Mm. There is no point having money, living in a nice house when your next door neighbor haven't even got, you see, a little piece of something to eat. Mm. What do you think? It will be looking at you. <laughs> it won't be good. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's leadership. For me, it's leadership. It's poor leadership that bring exactly what we're seeing currently in, in, in the whole world. It's because people who are leading the world are very short-sighted. 
I'm not saying that there's no resources, there's lack of resources, very, very limited resources. So these types of resources, food, we might not think food is a, 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 makes a difference, but it does make a difference. These food parcels that we have, delivering food parcels to people that are isolated, people that have lost their jobs, people that are suffering with mental health, makes a difference. Uh, women that are fleeing domestic violence, them, you know, themselves and their children, makes a difference. So resources need to be in place. We need to support volunteers that are doing well-being checks, delivering food pharmacy, uh, you know, packages. And uh, there just needs to be a lot more than what is being provided at this moment in time. Some of these organisations who are given the funding, we become their tick boxes. I mean, once they've drawn that funding, they will come to us, they will say, uh, you know, do you want to deliver health and well-being uh, in your centre? And we just become a ticket box. We want to be valued, our contribution to be valued, to be seen as a local citizen, Sheffield citizen, as supposed to be seen as a black person or BME. The definition, I mean, shouldn't be just a banner. I think we, we see ourselves as a, a citizen of Sheffield. And we want a clear representation at the decision-making level so that we can also get a share of the resources so that we can have the capacity to deliver those services. It's to do with funding, but it's also to do with the empathy. I mean, we need to, to, to show people that we're on their side. And people like to talk, people like to connect, people like to say something about how they're feeling. And if they don't get the opportunity to do that, that increases the, the impact on them. So we took initiative without funding. So for those of us in, in, in the leadership position, funding is not everything. It does help if you get the adequate resources, it does help to a certain extent. But we were genuine and passionate uh, as to what we were doing. So we came together and we, by coming together, we realized we were, all of us are under investment and in the disadvantage. So we did draw strength and our strength was by, by coming together and having one voice and then challenging the authorities under one voice rather than divide and rule. It is the result of our communication that will be the key. I mean, it's outcome on the ground. And I think many of our community also got that sense of the positive, the positive that you see what is currently happening is not what has happened in the past. That means we're talking to each other. It's just during this process of talking to each other that we want real results because our community have suffered. People who look like me and like others have suffered the most in this country. We're going to continue to provide clear information, transparent information, so we try and unravel the confusions of these guidelines that come through. We try and do our little bit uh, and continue to strengthen the um, uh, community organisations partnerships. I think the next step is to work harder on the messaging, make sure that, that, that the messaging is, is much more clearer. Uh, I think that we need to not to fear the virus in a way where we don't connect with people because that only increases the mental health issue. So I, I think there's a lot that we've got to do in terms of making sure that we connect with the, our communities much more. So we mobilise, had one voice, we talk regularly, we have, we've devised a strategy, one strategy, and we looked at the common themes, what we needed. So we put the advantage, the strength that we have within our organisation, what are the weaknesses and what are the opportunities that we can seize in terms of moving forward and working with the mainstream providers. So once we got our house in order, that's where we were constructed and now engaging with the mainstream services. It's, it's really too easy for me to blame others, but what I've seen recently in Sheffield over the past six months has been collaboration again and looking exactly into what has gone wrong. And I'm pleased to see that many of these people acknowledge their failure and they want to change. They want to build a better Sheffield for all of us, a city that's visible, a city that any single person, regardless of where they come from, regardless of the color of the skin, regardless of their religion, what they believe in, got a fair chance to crack onto the diamond that we got in this city. We want to do well together.